Hi, I'm David Grossman. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. You're watching The Real Estate Edge, where we interview experts in real estate to give buyers and sellers and investors the inside edge. I'm delighted to have with me in the studio here in Toronto today a real estate icon, developer, Harry Stinson. Harry, thanks very much for joining us. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Appreciate you coming in, fighting the traffic from Hamilton, coming in. It's nice to have you in the studio. So let me tell you a little bit about Harry Stinson and why he is in the studio today. Uh, Harry Stinson uh, was in the restaurant business for many years. Uh, he was in the entertainment business for many years, and he got into real estate in the 80s. Uh, his specialty in downtown Toronto was condos, um, and he got into condo loft conversions. The first major conversion that was really well known is called the Candy Factory Lofts. And that is a conversion that Toronto Life magazine said one is, was one of the most important conversions or events in Toronto because it contributed to the revitalization of the downtown core. And this is a phenomenon that we see all across America. Cities that have faced decay, manufacturing sector, other things, have been on the decline and there's all these magnificent buildings and you started this in Toronto you branched out to Hamilton and now you're looking south of the border Harry tell us what's your fascination with with the old buildings why is that important to you well to be honest it's not so much important to me as the fact that it became apparent after years and years of selling condos that customers love these old buildings. They love the character of the buildings. And increasingly in Toronto now, which is you know probably the top condominium market in, in the world, it is definitely statistically the top condominium market in North America, by far. In fact, uh, larger than New York, Montreal, and Vancouver put together, Toronto is an enormous condominium market. Yet, with all this quantity, the character is minimal. There aren't many buildings that stand out where you can, you recognize them, where you, people can look at a picture of it and say, well, I know that building, mm -hmm. or they can visit it and say, wow, this is cool. The market, condominium market has become a commodity. Right, but, but there are many of these old buildings around. In, well, in many cases, they've been abandoned, well, virtually abandoned. In the States, I would say, yes, there's an enormous quantities of grand old buildings. Canada, not so much. We're not a grand, society. We don't do things in the same sort of over-the-top way the Americans do. And frankly, a lot of them are lost. There aren't the protective elements, there aren't the incentives in Canada for people to keep and restore the old building. Now Toronto does have a number of neat old lofts. It does have a relatively healthy uh, office sector of converted old warehouses, but the quantity is just a, a you know, drop in the bucket compared to new construction. And people really miss the character buildings. They'll pay a premium for them. Mm -hmm. They'll want to live in them. And when you see the market cycle up and down, as it has in Toronto over the last 30 years, even though there's been prosperity for the last few years, the iconic buildings, the buildings with character, have kept their value and have always been in demand. So my, my fascination with buildings is customer driven. Okay, now you started looking south of the border a few years ago. I mean, yes. we talked over a year ago. You were telling me about the Buffalo Central Tournament. Yes. Your, I believe Three your years. foray was the Niagara Hotel, which you purchased, did some work, sold for a profit very recently. Four years of working on that, and within months of having acquired the Hotel Niagara, which is a 1929 old hotel. It's a grand hotel. It's in Niagara Falls and so on. Um, the architect who was working on it said, you know, if you like this building, you're going to love the Buffalo Central Terminal. I said, okay, well, all right, fine, I'll look at it. You know, every day someone calls me or sends me an email, goes, you've got to look at this building. Uh, you've got to look at this. Once in a lifetime. You've got to see this one. Every day. Every, every day, once in a lifetime. Everybody's got a building for Everybody's you. got something just amazing. So I went and looked at it. And this time, this was a genuine, holy oh, shit. Building. Right. Everybody who's seen this building walks in the door and just, right. Wow. Yes. It is over the top. And you've seen it. It is, it is a spectacular building. It's like Union Station, except it's bigger. 
Right. It occupies uh, a 16 acre parcel of land. It has outbuildings that are grand old warehouse type buildings. It's a stunning space. And um, I was aware of it. I watched it and watched it, hoping that sometime, maybe in my dreams, this thing might become available. And then, lo and behold, a few months ago, I got a frantic email from another one of the architects. Guess what? RFP, Buffalo Central Terminal. You got to throw your hat in the ring. So we did. So you did, and you've got it. And like you said, I was at this tour um, last weekend, and uh, it, it is an absolutely uh, incredible building. Well, you just have the short tour. I mean, you can spend hours walking around in that place and still find new catacombs, and it's just a phenomenal place. It's a million square feet inside. But, but Harry, a lot of developers would run the other way from these types of buildings. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll, they'll do the cookie cutter, you know, mass developments. It's All easier. the houses are the same. It's easier to build, it's easier to finance. But you're not, you're not afraid of these projects. Maybe there's something wrong with <laughs> Masochism. Well, you know, anything that you do first time is going to be frustrating, a mm -hmm. nightmare. Second time, maybe even third or fourth time. I've been doing this for years and years and years and years. So after a while, the surprises aren't so surprising. Yes. And the solutions, I mean, these are, this is stones and wood and metal screwed or nailed together or piled. The technology is not that complicated. It's Egyptian. You know, not a lot has changed in, in terms of building technology. The surprises, to say, once you've solved it once or twice or three or four times, you so know, you're not afraid of it anymore. I'm not afraid of it. And what entices me is not only do I know I'll have a product that the customers will say, wow, I want it. And, and, and it's unlike any other product in the street. So nobody can say, I've got a cheaper version down the street. Come on over here, because right. there isn't one. Right. Not only do you have a one-of-a-kind product, but you can generally buy these buildings for essentially nothing. Because they're really scared by them. Yeah. If it's a designated landmark building, as the central terminal is, or candy factory in the middle of sort of an isolated area. Queen Street West, downtown Toronto, 20 years ago, was nowhere land. Empty stores, warehouses around it. It was a scary place. It was not a logical place for people to have a luxury condo. The building was free. Central Terminal, it was free. It was free. So Free, like literally free. Not just not that expensive, but zero. So are other developers not running after these buildings? There were two bits. Two bits. Two bits. So there's the developers are not hungry for these types of buildings, but it's the a lot consumers. Of work. It's a <laughs> lot of work. Tell us, tell us about well, that. Well, look, I mean, it's no involved? different than old cars. Off the I collect old cars. Mm -hmm. If I take my 67 Lincoln Lehman Peterson, which is the, the presidential model, I have this old Lincoln I pulled out of a yard in Tennessee. You take it into the GM dealer or the Ford dealer, and they've got the computers and the guys in the lab coats, state-of-the-art technology. They are the best in the business. Say, can you tune the carburetor? And they're like, carburetor? What, what? What's a carburetor? What's the carburetor? I have no clue what it is. But the old guy with the screwdriver, OK. That's good. Straightforward. It's straightforward if right. you know what you're doing. Right. I find the older buildings simpler. They're simpler. and. It's an amazing thing that you're doing for the city because there are cities that have downtown cores, different parts of cities all over North America, probably all over the world, where these incredible buildings, they're standing, and the, the areas oh, may orphans. not be safe. They're, they're they, often they're, they're designated they, landmarks. Right? People come in there. They're dangerous people coming in, potentially. Yeah, they can be. And when you go in, it changes the face oh, of a neighborhood. You have to go big or go home. Right. If I went into a neighborhood and cleaned up a house, mm -hmm. who cares? Right. Who notices? Right. If I go into a neighborhood and take something that's an entire city block or more, yeah. it gets attention. Starting off attention is, that guy nuts or something? Yeah. Why is he doing this? Right. Then people sort of, yeah, we'll go see how it goes, how it goes. It gets attention. And if the product, you're offering. If the building has the character, the curiosity grows. 
right. you know. And and by and large, I don't go, like I don't go into a neighborhood or into a building that just because it's cheap and it's available. Um, I have to see an upside. With Gibson School in Hamilton, for example, which we're working on, 1914 school. I looked at the building four years ago. Same building, same neighborhood, same address. But I did not see that neighborhood moving. It just yeah. gut Finally. instinct, eh. Mm -hmm. It's been like this for decades. I don't see any light on the horizon quite yet. I'm not, uh, there's a difference between um, you know, taking on something because it's there. I don't do it. I have to see an upside. To me, it's not a risk. Right. I say no every day to at least one of these once in a lifetime opportunities. I'm every sure. day something comes along. I usually say no pretty quickly to small locations, just no hope. The guy actually wants money for it mm -hmm. or too much. Right. It's too far gone, no character, no market. What am I going to do with it? I don't take these things on just for sheer, you know, I'll try it and some miracle will happen. Right. I have to see an upside. So a year ago, I went back and looked at the Gibson again. Now I saw potential in the neighborhood. The building had not changed. If anything, it had disintegrated a little more. Mm -hmm. The streetscape was largely the same. But Pan Am Games had just been awarded to the soccer games in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Instead of putting the stadium on the east side of the city, which they, or west side, which they should have done, they, in their lack of wisdom, decided to renovate an old stadium in the east end just down the street from it. Right. So when you put 100 million bucks into the whole stadium and redo the entire neighborhood, and Tim Horton steps in and takes naming rights mm -hmm. on the stadium, mm -hmm. and the province says, ooh, geez, we're going to have the most popular event, soccer, there, I guess we've got to figure out how to get people there. So they decide to build a GO station on the same street. Mm -hmm. And then you see major big box retailer a little further down doing a three block long mall with Royal Bank and Canadian Tire and Walmart. Walmart does not go into somewhere on a whim. Right. They do their demographics. And then you see the hospital down the street the other way quadrupling in size. Mm -hmm. Thousands of intern doctors working there. Right. And you see the for sale signs getting fewer and fewer because the, the low hanging fruit is being bought up. Yeah. And the artsy community is starting to live there more and more and more. And I'm saying, okay, the wind is shifting. Right. It's okay to go in now. The street still looks scruffy. Right. The building was, as I say, looking even shabbier. Mm -hmm. But it's changing. But you could smell it yeah. in the air. Yeah. That's when I go in. In that case, it's a city block. It's a 100,000 square foot building, solid, big building, dry, serviced. $1.8 million for the whole city block. Mm -hmm. What does $1.8 million get you in Toronto? Doesn't get you doesn't much anywhere. Gets you a, a big condo downtown, a house in Leaside, doesn't right. get you and much. And this is going to be like over 90 units. 96 units and seven townhouses. And uh, lovely units with big loss. high ceilings, 13, all 14 the characters foot ceilings, of, uh, maple of floors, lofts. big windows. Yeah. It's there. Right. In fact, the way I look at this complex, there's a gym out front, big gym that they built, an ugly box building. We're slicing it up into six live work townhouse lots. Mm -hmm. They're going to be 299 each. Oddly enough, that works out to $1.8 million. We just paid for the entire block. Right. So the, Using so a gym that was already there. Well, when you're, you're getting uh, real estate at that cheap, to be frank, um, the numbers add up. The and, numbers and, add up. And, and, the, and the, the final product, the condos, the, the are unique to the and area. And I sell them for more than the market, yeah. generally speaking. Now, your builder is going to say, wow, yeah, but renovations cost more. Because people watch these, you know, these Mike Holmes shows where, mm -hmm. of course, they have to drag, oh, my God, oh, horrible. They have to create all sorts of tension and crisis, how bad, or renovations, nightmare, nightmare, nightmare. Right. It's just a show. Yeah. Right, of course. Yeah, it's, it's, they have to dramatize <laughs> sure. it. Does Mike really, is Mike horrified by that? No, he knows what he's going to do. Mm. But he has to create some, you know, some drama. He has to terrify the customer right. a little bit. Right. I'm not scared by this well, stuff. And for a less experienced developer, there may be more drama. Our cost is 100, under 100 bucks a foot. New construction now is running close to 300, 250 to 300 a foot. I'd like, I'd like just to list off some of the 
some of the developments you've done over the years, uh, because these are these are all high-profile developments. The candy factory lofts I mentioned at the beginning. This was right at the turn the, the, when things started to turn in Toronto. Early Time 90s could not happen. have been better. Uh, better similar situation that you have now for Gibson in, in Hamilton. Hamilton. Yep. The Stimson timing School, is, is right. School, yeah. Exactly. Uh, the knitting mill, the Victorian, Grangetown, Graphic Arts Building, High Park Lofts, One King West, Sapphire to Tower, um, and now... Well, Sapphire was the only new project, and I, right. there wasn't actually yeah, that built. Was, that was quite different. It was, I still have the model, the plastic model, this giant model packed right. in my basement at home, and it will be built. One but it was, it was 15 years ago in downtown Toronto, I was going to build a 100-story tower. Well, the outrage, oh, well, that's far too tall. Downtown Toronto, that's way too big. Right. Well, maybe, maybe the, the moral of the story is, is to stick with the older buildings since... Well, the moral of that story was we bought the land for $7 million and sold it for $24.5 million. So, okay. you know, so who I, cares? I could, okay. you know, I could deal right. with the pain and suffering. Right, you know. right. Well, listen, this, the, this uh, old building thing that you're doing, these classic buildings, the, the Buffalo Central Terminal, it's a 1929 Art Deco. Uh, building and uh, it's gorgeous. I mean, who wouldn't want to have an office there or uh, a workspace there we or, will or have a home? Hotel component. We yeah. have residential. We'll have office. We have commercial. An event space. This is a wow event space. And there's there's an amazing history there where people used to go off. You know, the, the guys were going off to war. <laughs> well, and, and the, you mentioned it was built in 1929. Yes, it was built in 1929 just before the crash, just before. This enormous complex, which was planned supposedly to deal with this never-ending booming economy, which all of a sudden stopped booming. Yes. So as a train station, it actually never hit its mark. So the military took over. Right. And for decades, it was the primary drop-off destination for troops going off to this war, to that war, right. to whatever. So hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people went through that, off to war, right. and back again. Right. So there's a, a lot of nostalgia there. And you're in talks now um, with the local people who are in talks with the federal government about potentially reconnecting the line from Manhattan? Well, the line's still there. I mean, yeah. if you go to Buffalo Central Terminal, you're going to hear the trains going right through. Right. They still run from Toronto. That The main line runs from Toronto through Central Terminal, right yes. through it to Grand Central in New York. Right. So literally, if they stop, they could come right off in our doorstep. And they will. Right. Amtrak will stop there once we get it open. Well, I hear it's a, it's a much better alternative than the, than the current train station in Buffalo. Oh, from, you from can't what I'm, come close From what I'm this. hearing, it's, it's pretty pathetic. But yeah. I think the, the big opportunity here is to see, is to, is to see, and I think that uh, Buffalonians, do we call them Buffalonians? They do. <laughs> That, that the people in Buffalo and in New York State will feel something about this. That, From what I understand, they have been contributing to, uh, the local people have been contributing to the waterfront. They, they, the local people are very excited about seeing this renewal of Buffalo that has started. It's like you mentioned, this, this revitalization of downtown cores, which often is most extreme in cities that were heavily industrial, and, and particularly in steel. Mm -hmm. so Buffalo, Hamilton. Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, a lot of these cities that, that were enormously wealthy and dynamic a century ago. Mm -hmm. And when the industrial world either slowed down, was replaced by technology, or moved to the other side of the planet, these giant dinosaur industries just faded away. And cities that were, had all their eggs in that basket experienced far more collapse and pain than more cities like Toronto, which are more broadly based, have survived better. Yes. New York has survived better. The industrial cities have really felt the pain. But the thing they say about Buffalo is it was rich at the right time, and it was poor at the right time. Yes. And it seems like a weird thing to say, but what that means is when it was very wealthy, they built buildings that were grand. They yes. built for this future. They, the, you know, the sky was the limit. The largest city hall in North America. I mean, just yeah. spectacular buildings throughout Buffalo. More Frank Lloyd Wright buildings than Chicago. Mm. Really, really cool buildings throughout Buffalo. Then all of a sudden, the music stopped. 
And it floundered for so many years, so seriously floundered, it wasn't worth knocking them down. Yes. I mean, cities that have, you know, just changed and moved along, well, all the, you know, the, the urban rejuvenation mm. people come in, knock down the old buildings, and put up some tacky 1960s, 1970s structure, which is probably gone now, and destroy the grand old buildings. Well, Buffalo didn't really have that recovery. So all these grand structures survived. And now what's happening in Buffalo is as the economy revitalized, largely through education and health care, that the older buildings are being revived, converted, and used for office and residential. They're still there. And the character's there, and people appreciate it. Right. So Buffalo is actually becoming an architecture city. Yeah. Well, and, Chicago. and there's an opportunity for people to invest um, if they want to earn a, g a return and contribute towards the revitalization of, of these projects um, to assist. Uh, because for whatever reason, I guess the banks, they're not... Uh, well, tell I us about the... <laughs> you want to talk about the banks? Tell us about the banks. <laughs> Who doesn't know the banks? Banks are strange entities. They are either incredibly conservative and are never there to help you, or they go off on completely insane wild flyers and go bankrupt, <laughs> you know, trading currencies and, right. and making ridiculous loans to mm -hmm. silly companies. Um, but in between, for the average person, average business, they like the cookie cutter, conventional, you know, square peg, square hole. Right. Um, right. My buildings are never square peg, square mm -hmm. hole. They're always a little bit off the wall. In the construction development industry, real estate financing is very much commodity. It's very conventional. Same type of project as they've done 45 times before. The same guys, the same golfing buddies, the same market, the same. They like this formula. They can take it back to the credit committee and say, well, this one's just like the last one. Okay, no problem. Everybody all in favor right. say aye. And look at the big fat fee we're right. making. Right. I go in with something that's off the wall mm -hmm. for which there is no specific precedent, but get a little nervous. I mean, I've told this story many times, but with the candy factory, I presented to the usual suspects, all the usual banks, all six of them in Canada, right. you know, and got the usual silent treatment. Mm -hmm. One I presented to was TD, I'll say, and silent treatment. And so I go the way in my merry way, and a few weeks later, this gentleman comes into the, to the sales office of the candy factory, says, hey, remember me? And I said, uh, no. Sorry, I'm <laughs> done personal guy, but I do not right. remember you. Because it's a baseball cap, you know, young lady with right. and so on. So I was at the TD Bank, remember? You had a presentation of the bank. I was on the credit committee there, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, um, well, okay, I vaguely remember you now, but I have to ask, what the hell are you here for? You guys didn't even say, we'll call you back, we'll get back to you, my people will call you. You didn't even pretend to be interested. Mm -hmm. and now you're here? Why? He said, well, you know, I'm a banker. You know, I can't stick up my hand around once amongst my peers and say, let's take a flyer on this guy. That's yes. not what we do at the bank. We don't take flyers on things. Right. But I personally thought this was a very cool building. So my daughter here is looking for a condo, and they bought. Right. So right. individually, people will say, gut instinct, I yeah. want it. Did Steve Jobs do a market study for iPads? What was the market for iPads like? Probably pretty thin, like mm -hmm. not existent. That's right. And a gut instinct. You know, the gut instinct I have in real estate has been pretty good over the years. Mm -hmm. And but that's hard to sell to a committee. They're not in big in gut instinct. Indeed, indeed, it is. And and gut instinct is is why uh, is why I've been following your work closely for for over a year now, and and doing whatever I can. Um, to well, try and, and get the word out, and because that's, that's the feeling that I have. Well, that it's the right thing to do, and it makes really good sense. So I had to, yes. by necessity, develop my own private financing mechanisms, set up my own funds, put right. my own packages together, mm -hmm. which was a lot of time-consuming work. I mean, we've been doing our road show to a lot of places, but the reality is people get it. Right. We don't present to any group. And, and people say, this is ridiculous, and stomp out of the room. They may say, you know, it's not for me, or I don't have any money right now, or, you know, this is interesting, I want to look at it. Nobody laughs at it. Mm -hmm. They all get it. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we're not allowed to advertise, so we can't get into any specifics, but we will put a phone number 
on the screen and we can say that in some of the past projects uh, for example in the um, the Gibson School where there's a, a unique uh, project offered uh, that's called the builder buyback where you buy a condominium unit and the builder buys it back for you at the and time of closing. And we can talk about that. I mean that is not a security or anything like that. It's right. just buying and selling real estate. Right. And that's a, with that people get a fixed return. Well, I guess I give them a profit. I give them a profit. to 14 percent. Sure. We figure it out based on various right. factors but we essentially give them a buyback. They're buying and selling a condo. We give them a guarantee. We are the buyers back of it. And the neat part we added, the icing on the cake, was we managed to make it RSP eligible. Right, for Canadians, for RSP Canadians. eligible. But yes. Even in the U.S. you can do the same thing. The way the mechanism is structured is it essentially is a buying and selling of real estate, a normal transaction. The difference we bring to it is we're, buy we're the buyer. Mm -hmm. There's no middlemen. Right. You, you buy a condo from us, we agree to buy it back in three years' time at a fixed return. Right. And while we cannot say for sure that past performance is an indication of future performance, those are the those are the figures that Harry has been offering on on past projects like the Gibson. So that that gives you an idea uh, without I mean, being this is any specific in getting into specifics. Every project I've been involved in, I'm, I go in at the beginning of the market when the skeptics are saying, yeah, mm -hmm. it's not worth much over there. Right. And I have to sell at that price. Mm -hmm. I can only sell at what the market perceives that neighborhood to be, yes. which is tough when you're trying to start things going in that neighborhood. Right. But I've done it enough to know where it's going to be in three years. So people have an opportunity to invest, earn a return on their money, and know that they're contributing to the renewal of their city, um, wherever they're investing, or their country. So, wonderful opportunity. Um, and they can see it. And they can see it. And, and understand it. Right. Can you explain hedge funds to me? I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't it's know a gardening <laughs> company, as far as I know. If you know what a hedge fund is, call us. And if you'd like to learn more. You can come more. and see our buildings. Yes. And then you understand what do we do? We fix up buildings and we sell them for more money. Absolutely. Shall I say that again slowly? <laughs> One more time. We fix up. We fix up grand old buildings. Grand old buildings. And we dramatically increase their value. Well, that, that says it all. You've got the number on the screen, 416-876-2031. Do call that number. We look forward to hearing from you and discussing the opportunity with you further. Harry, thank you very much for coming into the studio. We thank will you. talk to you, and we look forward to hearing from you.